we have a little competition from, <laughs> I think from JFK Airport. <laughs> okay, so this retreat will be based on the first sutta in a collection of discourses of the Buddha that's called the Sutta Nipata. The name of the sutta in Pali is the Uraga Sutta. The word Uraga is translated as snake or serpent. The word actually is derived from the word Ura means belly, and Ga, the particle Ga, indicates going. So that which goes or moves on its belly is a snake. The Pali version of the sutta consists of 17 verses, but this particular series of verses was found in several of the early Buddhist, several of the early schools of early Buddhism. Usually we think, when we think about different forms of Buddhism, we think there's Theravada Buddhism or Southern Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, or Northern Buddhism, or Theravada, Southern Buddhism, East Asian Buddhism, and Tibetan Buddhism. But actually, during the period when the first few centuries of Buddhist history in India, there were a number of schools that accepted basically the same collection of texts, which they had organized somewhat differently. And so the verses that make up this sutta were shared by probably all of these early Buddha schools. And we have versions of these verses in texts that have been somehow preserved or recovered, rediscovered from several of these early Buddha schools. I don't want to get too scholarly or too scholastic but I will just mention some of these schools. Okay, we find the verses in a version in a language called Kandari. Kandari was the language which was used in an area that now corresponds to Pakistan or even parts of eastern Afghanistan. And so Buddhism had flourished in that region and the school that had that had thrived, had been established in that region is called the Dharma Guptaka school. Maybe for those who like to take notes. Okay, so we have the version in the Pali language, which is the language of, of, of the text that I've given out, and that is the language that was used by the Theravada school. Probably in India, my suspicion is that it flourished in Western India. Can people in the back see? Is it large enough to see in the back? And in the corner? You can see? Yep. Okay. Okay. The version preserved in the Kandari language belonged to a school called the Dharma Guptaka, which flourished in the northwest, now Pakistan, Afghanistan, okay, 
then there's another version of the verses which belongs to a work called the Patna Dharmapada. The school affiliation is not known. And then there's another version in a preserved in Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. I'm sorry. I should correct myself. This version is a language called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, which is a partly Sanskritized version of an older language, very close to Pali. And then there is a version in regular Sanskrit, ordinary Sanskrit, that was preserved by a school called the Savasti Vada school. And it's preserved in a work. This school flourished probably in the area around Kashmir. And it's preserved in a work called the Udana Varga. It was interesting. Everybody knows the work called the Dhammapada, I assume. Okay, in the Gandhari version is preserved in their version, the Gandhari version of the Dharmapada. The Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit is preserved in the Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit in the Patna Dharmapada. The Udana Varga is a work similar to the Dharmapada which was held by the Savastivada school. They didn't call it Dharmapada, they called it Udana Varga. In the Theravada school, these verses are not included in our Dharmapada. Instead, the sutta was collected into a different compilation, the one called the Sutta Nipata. And yet it's remarkable when you look at these different versions how similar they are. There is an English monk, British monk in Malaysia, who was originally ordained in Sri Lanka, who has compiled a little work, which is a comparison of the different versions of the Uraga Sutta, the Discourse on the Serpent. And this shows the correspondence this is the list of the verses in the Pali version, and it shows which verses that are present in the Pali version are also found in the other versions. And just to show you how similar they are, please lock the door. I don't want anybody to get bored or frightened by it. <laughs> it's not running out. <laughs> This is just the beginning. I'm not going to go into this detailed scholarly stuff. I'll make it more, more lively. <laughs> but I think this is very interesting. Because these regions of India are so widely separated, and the languages, of course, they come from a common root, but they develop somewhat differently. But you just take one verse here in the Pali version, you look at the, the Patna Dharmapada version, so almost exactly the same. The Udana Varga ver version, since it's in Sanskrit, the language looks a bit different, but if you study it closely, you can see it's very, very similar. The big difference, the, all of the other versions have this Vichinam, which would mean something like investigating or examining. For some reason, perhaps for a metrical reason, this, the Udana Varga version couldn't fit that word in, so they replaced it with buddhva, which means having understood. And the version which it's, the language is most remote from the Pali is the Gandhari language. But still, and then it's, the Gandhari version has been found, has been just like 
fragmentary. So scholars have had to sort of reconstruct missing letters where the letters have been eaten away from the bark. It was a bark manuscript that was discovered. Just over the last, it was in the last century, these bark manuscripts were discovered. But you could see, despite, yeah, there's some problems here, but you could see, actually it seems that this should go down here and this should go up here. It looks like he made a mistake there. Okay, so now, <laughs> after that excursion through northern India, taking us as far as Pakistan, <laughs> Now we come back to our text, the text that we're going to use, which is the Pali version of the Sutta. And now, the Pali version consists of 17 verses, and each verse can be divided into two portions. The third and fourth lines are the same in every verse. They constitute what we would call the refrain and the refrain is the same. The part that differs from verse to verse are the first two lines, the opening couplet. And in that opening couplet, what is described, often with the corresponding simile, is a particular defilement or delusion that has to be overcome that has to be eliminated in order to reach the final goal of the Buddha's teaching. The final goal of the Buddha's teaching is the attainment of Nibbana, or what we would call final liberation from the cycle or the process of repeated birth, aging, and death. And according to the Buddha's teaching, what holds us in bondage to this cycle of repeated birth and death are the kilesas, the defilements of the mind. And these defilements, maybe we could distinguish into two broad categories. Emotive defilements and cognitive Defilements. So the emotive defilements, sort of the most prominent of the emotive or emotional defilements, is craving. And we could say it's out of craving, either directly or indirectly, that all of the other emotional type of defilements emerge. Anger, conceit, jealousy, miserliness, arrogance, and so forth. Okay, the cognitive defilements, this means misunderstanding or misinterpretation, a wrong cognitive grasp of the nature of things. And the most prominent example of this defilement is ignorance. And it is out of ignorance that the other cognitive defilements arise. We could call these other cognitive defilements delusions. And so here, from craving, we get the derivative defilements, and from ignorance we get the various delusions, or we call them distortions of understanding. And so what has to be accomplished in order to win the final goal of the Dharma, the final goal towards which the Buddha points, which is the goal of Nibbana. So the task 
is to eliminate gradually, step by step, but definitely to eliminate the craving and all of the defilements that are derived from craving and to eliminate ignorance and all of the delusions, distortions and also wrong views that emerge from ignorance. And so the, in the verses of this sutta, the first couplet specifies a wide variety of either emotional defilements or cognitive defilements that have to be eliminated. Okay, now in this opening session, I want to focus on the refrain of the Uraga Sutta. That is the third and fourth lines, these lines which are repeated in every sutta, in every verse of the sutta. And so first, let us recite the refrain. I'm going to have a little experience of speaking in Pali. <laughs> so we will recite the refrain together in Pali. First I'll recite it, and then you repeat after me. So, Bhikkhu Jahati so, Jahati Ora Parang Ora Parang Ura Go Jinamiva Ura Go Jinamiva Tachang Puranang Tachang Puranang Okay, and the meaning Okay, Bhikkhu is monk Jahati gives up then Ora means here, what is close, what is near. And param is what is beyond. Then urago is the serpent. Jinam is old. Eva is like or as. Tachang is skin. And puranam is, actually purana would be old, and jinam is also old, but here it's translated worn out. So putting it together, the monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its old, worn out skin. Now when we look at this verse, there is a little problem. If any of you are well read in Buddhist literature, you might immediately recognize what this problem is. But anyway, I'll specify what it is. And I've done this actually with example from several suttas, taking several suttas to spell out the problem. And that concerns, the problem concerns the meaning of aura and para. Okay, now in many texts in the Pali Canon, the word para, meaning beyond, is used to indicate the goal of the Buddha's teaching. So para is actually used in a number of suttas as a metaphor for Nibbana. And so the goal, according to the standard suttas is to give up aura, what is near. Near represents samsara, the world of birth and death, and to attain the beyond, to go to the beyond. But here the text is saying that the monk gives up the here and the beyond, which seems paradoxical. Now if you're a reader are familiar with Mahayana Buddhism, then you might point to the sutta and say, to your Theravadan friends, you see? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very ancient sutta, and it's just like the Prajnaparamita Sutra is saying, give up the near, give up 
give up samsara, give up nirvana, and realize the non-duality of samsara and nirvana. But I don't think that would be correct. <laughs> because there's no other suttas in early Buddhism which would support that kind of point of view. Okay, this is, I took a couple of suttas, of suttas which show us the standard way of conceiving the relationship of the near and the beyond. This is the sutta which lays out the famous simile of the raft. So are people, are, is everybody familiar with the simile of the raft? Probably lots of people know this, this simile. And this is the way it occurs in the original text. Okay, suppose a man is on a journey and he sees a great expanse of water whose near shore, now the word translated as near shore is orimang tirang. Tirang is shore and the word orimang is derived from ora, meaning near. So the near shore is dangerous and fearful and the far shore that is Parimantiram, which is derived from para, is safe and free from fear, but there is no ferry boat or bridge to go across to the far shore. So then he realizes this, that there is no ferry boat or bridge for going from the near shore to the far shore. And the Pali here is Param gamanaya, for going beyond. And so he decides to build a raft and then he makes an effort with his hands and feet and he gets safely across to the far shore. And then the Buddha applies the simile and says that I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft. For the, it's for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. So here we have the simile and we find a, sem a, a similar simile in another sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya. This is in chapter 35, sutta number 238. And here the Buddha specifies what he means by the different components in the simile. So he says, the great expanse of water is a designation for what is called the Four Floods, a metaphorical term signifying sensuality or sensual desire, craving for renewed existence, views and ignorance. These are conceived as floods because they're sort of barriers that prevent us from going across. Then the near shore, which is dangerous and fearful, this is a designation for, I translate a little freely, the world of conditioned phenomena represented by the five aggregates that constitute the experience of body and mind. So in other words, this near shore, it's, we could also say that this is samsara, the process of birth and death. Then the far shore, which is safe and free from danger, that's a designation for Nibbana. And the raft is the Noble Eightfold Path. Making the effort with hands and feet is a designation for arousing energy. And the person, the one who is crossed over and gone beyond, that's para gato, who has gotten to the beyond, that's the designation for the arahant, the liberated one, the realized one. Okay, then I took a few passages from elsewhere in the Sutta Nipata. Here somebody is speaking to the Buddha, the Buddha, he says, I ask the Muni, Muni is a sage, who has crossed over, gone beyond, who has attained Nibbana. 
So he had gone beyond and attained Nibbana by just synonyms. And there's another verse, here the Buddha is praising the Arahant and says, one who has passed beyond the swamp samsara, a meditator who has crossed over, gone beyond, who has attained nibbana through no clinging, he is the one I call a Brahman. So in all of these suttas, the Buddha is designating the beyond as the goal of the teaching. And he's praising the one who has gone beyond as the one who has attained the goal, who has achieved Nibbana. So then we come back to our present sutta. How does it go again? The monk gives up the here and the beyond as a serpent sheds its worn-out skin. So is the Buddha telling us, give up both samsara and nipana <laughs> and dwell somewhere in the never-never land between them or beyond them? Okay, so to make sense of this, I think the sutta has to be carefully interpreted. And the commentary gives us some idea how to interpret it. So it says, so in this expression, the here is the six internal sense spaces. Okay, the internal sense spaces are the six sense faculties. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the mind faculty. And the six external sense spaces are their objects visible forms, sounds, odors, tastes, text, uh, t textures, and mental objects. That explanation I don't find so convincing. <laughs> but what comes next, I think, is probably on track. So in the Buddha's teaching, we distinguish different realms of existence. In the classical formulation we have one way to look at it is five realms, the hells, the realm of afflicted spirits, animals, human beings, and the deities or devas who dwell in the heavenly realms, they're not in any way deities in the sense of being creator gods, or powerful gods, but they're just beings who, through their good karma in, as human beings, have been reborn temporarily in these celestial realms. And when their time is up, they pass away and take rebirth elsewhere. And then another way to divide up the realms of existence is the desire realm, which actually includes, maybe I should put it this way, So the desire realm, this is the realm of existence in which sensual desire is the primary motivation, includes all five of these, the lower types of deities. You know, so if you get to be a deity in this realm, you shouldn't be too, too proud. <laughs> <laughs> because from another point of view, there are a state called the, a realm called the form realm, which consists of something like approximately 15 higher divine realms, with divine states, divine planes, we'll call them planes, inhabited by different types of deities. 
and then above the formless realm, above the form realm is the formless realm, which consists of four planes of existence in which there's no more even residue of material form. And so there are all of these realms of existence into which beings are reborn through their karma, through their actions, their volitional actions. And all of these realms, are, or life in all of these realms is transitory. According to the karma one creates and stores up, one takes rebirth there. When the karma is exhausted, one passes away and takes rebirth elsewhere. And so that cycle of birth, aging, death, that is samsara. And so from this point of view, what the commentary says, okay, from one angle, the here is the human world, and the beyond is the world of the devas. And so for ordinary people, they think, oh, this human world is so much trouble, so much affliction, so many problems. Ah, but the heavenly realms, those are the blissful realms. That's what I aspire for. And so if they do enough meritorious deeds, wholesome good deeds, they can be reborn there and enjoy the bliss of the heavens. For them, that's the beyond. And lifespan is extremely long, so they think that's eternity, eternal bliss. But there's another side to that story, <laughs> which is that after hundreds of years, or thousands of years, or hundreds of thousands of years, the lifespan comes to an end, to be followed by existence elsewhere. Okay, so from another Looking from another angle, the here is the, the desire realm. So even taking in the lower heavenly realms, those belong to the desire realm, and the beyond is the form and formless realms. So if you practice, so you recognize even that heavenly realms with those deities dancing and singing <laughs> and playing in their parks. <laughs> That's not good enough for me, but I want the pure, everlasting bliss of samadhi. And so one practices concentration meditation very diligently and one attains the deep meditative absorptions we call it jhanas. And so that becomes the cause for rebirth into the form realm, or if one takes it to even deeper levels, the formless realm. And so existence there can last world cycles. And we're not even thinking in terms of hundreds and thousands or millions of years. But, like, you know, they say the Big Bang took place, what is it, 13 billion years ago? Okay, suppose it goes on another 13 billion years. Just suppose we're in the middle of the big expansion. So, what is that, 13 by 2? 26 billion years. Then comes you know, a stage of disintegration. So, another 26 billion years. So. 26, 52 billion years. So that's one kalpa, one aeon. And when you're in the form and formless realm, there, according to the level, there are multiple kalpas. So you're going through, you know, 10 big bangs, 20 big bangs, 100 big, <laughs> big bangs. <laughs> you know, that's going on in the human realm, and you are there absorbed in bliss or quiescence, peace, equanimity, stillness. So, from the perspective of the desire realm, that's the beyond. But that too comes to an end. 
you know, if you're absorbed in the formless realm, 20,000 big bangs, eventually, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Guess what, Bhante? <laughs> Your 20,000 kalpas have come to an end. <laughs> wait, wait, give me 21, give me 21. No, 20,000, that's what you earn. <laughs> so it's over and down you go. And so that's the continuation. Okay, so you think that's the beyond, but it's still within samsara. Okay, so then the, the next way of taking it is the desire and form realms are the here, and the beyond is the formless realm. Basically the same principle. So, what the Buddha is saying when he speaks about that the monk gives up the here and the beyond is that one gives up attachment here the text says abandoning desire and lust in relation to any of these interpretations of the here and beyond so one gives up desire and attachment to conditioned existence in any of its forms, whether in this state, here and now, or in some existence beyond the present state, some future existence conceived to be desirable, blissful, the ultimate. Because what one takes to be the ultimate from this perspective is still conditioned and transient. Okay, then the German monk, Venerable Nyanapolika Tera, who was actually my, my teacher in Sri Lanka, has written a booklet called The Worn Out Skin, which you can find on the internet. I'll also make it available through the center. And he explains, first he explains the here and the beyond in this way, as rebirth either in, back into this world or in some other realm. But then he gives it the phrase, a wider interpretation. He says that the here and the beyond also applies to all of those various discriminations, dichotomies, and pairs of opposites in which our minds habitually move, the lower and the higher, the inner and the outer, the life-affirming or worldly good and the bad, acceptance and rejection. In brief, it signifies the ever-recurring play of opposites, and as this play maintains the game of life with its unresolvable dissatisfactions, disappointment, and suffering, the Buddha calls on us to give it up. Okay, so that explains it's my way of explaining the line, the monk gives up the here and the beyond. Okay, then the refrain, the fourth line, is the simile, as a serpent sheds its old, worn-out skin. Has anybody ever seen a snake shed its worn-out skin? At least one person has. I've seen in my life, I've come across on occasion, the worn-out skin of a snake. I don't think I've ever seen a snake in the process of shedding its skin. It would be interesting to see. Okay, but the commentary has a, inter a, a picturesque way of describing the process and relating it, relating the simile to the task that confronts this monk. Okay, so it says that by seeing the various dangers or drawbacks or faults 
in all the realms of conditioned existence, that is, seeing the faults of samsara. And so this monk feels disgust or dis, dis, disenchantment or dis, disillusionment with the here and the beyond, which is like the old worn-out skin then depending on good friends, good spiritual friends, teachers, guides, for encouragement, like the snake, he arouses his strength, his energy. Then as the snake bends its tail, the monk bends his legs crosswise, <laughs> people sitting on chairs, <laughs> no, but it really doesn't matter. But this is the traditional meditation position, sitting. It doesn't have to be full lotus, but crosswise. Striving diligently, then as the snake spreads its hood, probably describing a cobra that's shedding its skin, and discards its old skin, the monk spreads out his knowledge, that is, his insight knowledge, that is developing the insight knowledge into the true nature of conditioned phenomena and he gives up the here and the beyond that is while he's still alive he gives up the craving for this world and worlds beyond the present one and then just as the snake having discarded the old skin departs wherever it wishes so the monk, having give up, given up the here and the beyond, departs in the direction of the Nibbana element without residue remaining. Okay, what this means, this last expression, the text distinguished two elements, or maybe we could call these two stages in the attainment of Nibbana. Okay, the first stage is the stage of Nibbana attained while alive. So this is the, you might call the experiential realization of Nibbana. Nibbana that's attained with the eradication of greed, hatred, and delusion. And so the defilements are all eliminated, but the composite of the five aggregates that constitutes the person continues through the rest of the lifespan. And then with the termination of this lifespan, with the ending of this present life, then comes the attainment of what's called the Nibbana element without residue. So this is the unconditioned state itself in which there's no more residue of physical and mental experience. So that is the ultimate and final one. Okay, that actually takes me through what I wanted to cover this evening. So maybe, maybe we could take 15 minutes if there's any questions. 10 or 15 minutes. So the schedule says that the retirement time is 9.30, but That's fine. you were so strict <laughs> in laying down the house rooms. <laughs> I'm Italian. <laughs> but just if there's any questions on this. Oh, please, yeah. I heard that Mara is king of the heavenly realm. Is he at the top of the sense, desire realm, and desire realms? Yeah, actually, Mara is not really the king of the heavenly realms. What is said is that, and this all comes in the commentaries, you know, sort of, I say sometimes one has to take what is said in the commentaries with a grain of salt, but I'll tell you what they say. But Mara resides in the highest of the lower heavenly worlds, the sense sphere, heaven, the desire realm heavenly worlds, not as the ruler of that realm, but it's said that he resides in that realm like a rebel, <laughs> a rebel prince in the kingdom. Like he lives 
on the outer frontier, r frontier of that realm with his followers and from there he comes into the human realm to make trouble for human beings. <laughs> yeah. So let's say someone um, attains a degree of, of, they have a good practice and they go into the, is it the form realm? Yeah. Yes. And then they come back. But then what if, I mean, I know this is conjecture, but what if, like, say, there is no back here? Like, let's say that, you know, that, um, I don't know, there's, like, global disaster or whatever, and there's no more human beings. Yeah. So then what's there to come back to? Do you know what I mean? Because I kind of, you know, wonder that sometimes. I would say probably that they will not pass from that, for, say the form realm, back into the human realm, unless there is there are human beings in the world, yeah. unless that there is human human existence in the world. So probably they'll remain there until the human world becomes reconstituted. But what if it doesn't? It will. It will. Yeah. Maybe not on this planet Earth, but at, on some world system. Planet, there will be planets that emerge which are capable of sustaining um, intelligent life corresponding to human life. Did I say intelligent life corresponding to human life? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after some of the things that human beings do to each other and to the planet. Monty, I had a question. Okay, thank you. Well, I have a few, but some are more pertinent than others. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the more pertinent one that I was thinking of initially. Yeah. When you mentioned some of the early Buddhist schools, you mentioned the Dharma Buddha, you mentioned the Shravastivada, I wanted to know what are the points of contention that they had with Theravada, and then how did they inform upon Theravada, like influence How did they? Like influence Theravada school of Buddhism at all. Yeah, I mean, that's a... <laughs> That's a question for a college course on early Buddhism. <laughs> but let me just try to take it very, very simply. I didn't eliminate my diagram. Oh, I think I did. Okay, so I have to re reconstitute it in my mind. Okay. The First, the Theravada school and the Dharmaguptaka school, which flourished in the Northwest, are actually probably, I think, in doctrine, very, very similar. I, they were both, I think, branches of an, or, an original Indian school, which sort of spread out in two directions. The branch which went to the northwest became the Dharmaguptaka, and the branch which went to the west and then from the west came down to Sri Lanka became the Theravada, is what's known as the Theravada. So they are very, very similar. Okay, the school from which the Patna Dharmapada arose it has not been identified. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that saves me the trouble for answering, <laughs> dealing with that problem. The Savastevada school, like their main tenet, it's a pretty technical point. What they say is that dharmas or phenomena exist throughout the three periods of time, past, present, and future, they become manifest. They become manifest only in the present, mm. but the dharmas or the phenomena themselves exist past, present, and future. Whereas the Theravada and probably the Dharmaguptaka say that phenomena exist only in the present. That the past is gone. In, from the standpoint of the past, they have not yet arisen, and from the standpoint of the future, 
the present is already gone, so they no longer exist. Mm -hmm. So that seems to have been the main point of contention. And it seems the Theravada position makes good sense to me. It accords with the Buddha's teaching of impermanence, the path, things don't exist in the past, they come up, exist temporarily in the present, then they're gone, and no longer exist in the future. Yeah, the Savastivada school, I can't figure it out. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, okay, so another one for now. There was a hand right here. Also, it's good when you raise a question to also tell me your name so then I could remember in the future. Margaret. My question was about um, the definition of the here and the beyond in the worn out skin. Yeah. It felt very zen. Would it be it felt very zen? Zen. Would it be correct understanding to see it as talking about non duality? Yeah. That is the way maybe a follower of Zen or one of the Maya schools looking at this might say. Might say <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> But the point that I was trying to make is that if one looks at the corpus of the texts of early Buddhism, one doesn't find anything else to support that idea that one gives up both this world, or both the samsaric world and nirvana. Oh. Yeah. You see, the point is that in most of the Buddhist texts, the word para, beyond, represents nibbana. And so the goal is to go from the here to the beyond. That is in standard Buddhist, uh, uh, the standard Buddhist way of speaking, throughout most of the texts. But this, this particular verse, was, uh, or poem is quite unique in speaking about giving up the here and the beyond. But I don't think we have to take the text as being consistent in their in their purport. And so I would say that that line has to be interpreted in a way that agrees with the main body of text. So we can't take give up the here and the beyond to mean give up both samsara and nibbana but rather it should mean that one gives up both this existence in this realm and existence in realms beyond this present realm. So am I correct in understanding that your definition of non-duality assumes giving up both samsara and nibbana? It's giving up. Both samsara and nibbana. Not giving up both samsara and nibbana, but giving up samsara in order to attain nibbana. So both the here and the beyond both designate possibilities within samsara. The here is the realm that we're familiar with, the beyond are these higher realms within samsara. Does that make it clear? Anyway, as we go along, I think it will get clearer. I have a question actually from someone who's watching live, Conan. Yeah. Um, Conan is asking if it is inevitable that we return to a human life to continue practice until achieving nirvana, then are all other realms equivalent to getting sidetracked? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a, a good question. My understanding would be that If one acquires we call right view or right understanding of the Dharma in the, as a human being, and one gets reborn into the higher realms, the Deva realms, the form realm, one will retain the disposition to that right view and the right practice in those realms. And so one can continue to practice in those realms. There is a lot of maybe possibility of being sidetracked in those realms because there's, the lifespan is so much longer and there's so much more bliss and enjoyments 
But if one really has a clear understanding of the Dhamma, and maybe a strong foundation in, in practice, then one can continue to, to practice in those realms. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking of a sutta in which there's a monk <laughs> who's pra practicing very diligently <laughs> and then during his practice he passes away and is reborn in the heavenly realm but he doesn't realize that he's passed away <laughs> <laughs> so he looks around and he's in this heavenly realm but he's still you know, he looks around he sees these palaces and these beautiful beings dancing and singing but he thinks okay I'm still a monk <laughs> 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 and then a lovely female deity <laughs> comes to him and sort of hits his shoulder and says, Come on and play. <laughs> and he says, No, I'm a monk, I'm practicing. <laughs> and he says, You're not a monk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then he looks around and he says yeah this doesn't look like the human world anymore how do I get out of here <laughs> okay Akash. Akash. Is Mara a real being who is really obsessed with making us do unskippable things, or is it like a symbolic representation of our development? Yeah, this is a very interesting question, and I don't know how to give a definitive answer to that, but. Yeah, there's a commentarial explanation of. They speaks of, I think it's four, yeah, the four types of Mara. So it says that the, the word Mara actually could be taken to signify four things. Let me see if I can remember them all. Okay, one is Mara as the defilements. So Mara is just like a symbol for the defilements. In that case, you're know, symbolic. Then there's the Mara of the five aggregates because there are some suttas in which the Buddha says, what is Mara? Material form is Mara. Um, the feeling, perception, the volitional activities, consciousness, those five aggregates are Mara. So that's the second type of Mara. The third type of Mara is death, physical death. Because the word Mara itself comes from the verb Marati, which means to die. There's actually a causative form, which means to kill. Okay, so Mara is death. And then the fourth Mara is, Mara is that mischievous, troublesome deity. And the one thing that I'll say about Mara is the mischievous deity in Buddhism, in contrast to the devil of Christianity, Mara has no connection at all with hell, no interest in getting being people to commit sins that will cause them to fall into hell. Mara's task is simply and solely to prevent people from breaking out of the cycle of birth and death, from gaining liberation. So if people want to meditate and gain the absorptions and go into the super divine realms, Mara is perfectly content with that. Just don't aim at the breakthrough realization. Doesn't that being realized that it's very bad for that being to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay, I think Will had another question. Yeah. Um, 
how do Buddhists like you, you mentioned how they were piecing together Gandhari scripts, you yeah. know, like the Nasr Sura, whatever, or other things like this? How do they piece them together and surmise that these words come to mean these which have parallels in Pali or Hybridized? Yeah, Pali? yeah, it's a very, very rigorous field of study, and particularly with the with the Gandhari texts, because the the way these have been recovered. It's the case of like just villagers finding a cave and then they go into a cave and then you know digging around in the cave they find a vase, like a vase, something like a vase. They sell it on the market and somebody buys it and breaks the vase and rolled up in that vase is birch bark scroll and they um, hopefully they don't rough it when they enroll it, but they realize that it might be something valuable to the world of scholarship, and so eventually it winds up in the hands of scholars who have to very carefully unroll those scrolls, which are, you know, there are holes in them, sometimes they're just uh, become fragments or pieces which have to be put together, and then they're written in a script, the script is called, the Gandhari ones, are called, it's called Karoshti, which actually, that script actually is related not to the Indian scripts, but to the Semitic scripts, like Hebrew or Arabic. And so there are scholars who know the Karoshvi script. I have no idea what I've written. And then they're able to you know, put letter to put together letter by letter and to figure out the words. And once they figure out the words, then I guess there might be some scholars who have become familiar with the, the grammar or phonology, the, the sound values of, of Gandhari. And once they do that, then one could, because Gandhari itself is an Indian language related to Sanskrit, related to Pali, so then they can you know, compare it with corresponding, say, Pali and Sanskrit texts, and then figure out what the text is saying, and then see where it will differ from, say, the Pali version and the Sanskrit version. So they sort of figure out which words in this Semitic, how do you pronounce it? Krishna? No, it's called Karoshti. Karoshti. Yeah. They figure out which which words phonetically have a similar sound to the one in Pali and the one yeah. in Sanskrit. Yeah. Like kind of do peer review to figure out how they probably have to Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to do it like letter by letter, word for word. And then at a certain point, then they'll see like several lines and they'll recognize, ah, this looks like a verse from the Dhammapada. And then they'll look at the other pieces of text that they've, uh, that they've obtained and then put them together and then see, ah, this also is a verse from the Dhammapada. This also is a verse from the Dhammapada. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So in that way, they get this. Um, it's very incomplete, but it's this collection that they call the Gandhari Dharmapada. Thank you. Um, geographically, where did the Sarvastivada school correspond to? I think their sort of main base would have been Kashmir. So they were spread out over quite a wide region in India. Yeah. But isn't that, and then you know, they do like lifetimes of 
practicing yeah, and yeah. like in this like like suffering and or just pretty much like give out everything you have to help these things and try to do it. Yeah. Isn't that that like isn't that also a form of grasping? Like a, a form of grasping, like an ego based desire is like this is like, you know, mm. the one thing I'm, like you know, like I have to do is like to get there. <laughs> yeah, isn't it driven by a like an kind of egoistic desire? Okay. Like an ego desire. By like, ego I desire. To, I like, guess. I, have to do this, yeah. I, have to, like, I guess, from the Mahayana point of view, uh, <laughs> I have to be careful because I live in a Chinese Mahayana. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> I don't want anybody reporting to the other thing. <laughs> okay. Probably what, I, what they would say, somebody who's following that path, is that I'm doing so, but at the same time, I'm trying to give up the egotistic attachment, but pursuing this vow, this bodhisattva vow, to liberate beings out of compassion for, for beings. But I thought when you do things out of compassion, you just do it out of natural compassion, not forcing yeah. yourself. Like yeah. I have to do this because yeah. to, it's like that's like almost taking it away from it, isn't it? It's like it's not like you have to do it to validate yourself. That's yeah. almost like grasping. Yeah. So it's it's more like you do it because you naturally feel compassionate. If you don't want to do it, that's fine too. Yeah, I mean of course it's perfectly fine. That's fine too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we'll have to end for the evening because it's getting close to ten o'clock. And then tomorrow we start going into the content of the verses themselves. Okay, so let me end. I always like to end the session with the short sharing of the merits. And so, do you think that when we speak on Dharma and then listen to Dharma, then we create wholesome karma, which we can share with other beings, beings who have passed away, particularly if you have like close relatives who have passed, or friends who have passed away. And then we share also with the devas, the deities, the special type of deities who are called dhamma-protecting deities. So we share the merits with them, asking them to rejoice in our merits and by doing so to protect the dharma in this human world and also to help Bhante Sudaso and Giovanna to get enough rent and other provisions <laughs> to maintain the center. No, I'm, I'm speaking seriously because when we share merits with them, they sort of work behind the scenes to make these things happen. You know, sometimes things happen completely unexpectedly, you get sudden benefit. And how did that happen? invisible beings who are helping us from behind the curtain, so to speak. Okay, so I'll recite these verses in the Pali language and in your minds and hearts you share the merits of good thoughts wishing for well-being and happiness to the protective deities. Akasa ta jabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anamodipa Chirang Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anamodipa Chirang Rakantu Desanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anamodipa Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang E tavatacham he hi sampadam punya sampadam sabe deva no modam tu sabha sampati sedia sabe buddha no modam tu sabha sampati sedia sabe sada no modam tu sabha sampati sedia pavagupadaya vici he tato e tantare satakayu papana Rupiya Rupicha Asanya Sanino 
Dukkha Bhavachantu Pusantu Nibhutin And you say Sadhu 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 Okay, so that is it. Okay, so have a good night and peaceful. Thank you.